Okay, morning guys. Hope you're all well. So, 10th of June. Let's see, start of a new week. And we've got some moves across markets this morning, just uh, sort of digesting the developments over the weekend. Perhaps the key one um, being that uh, Trump has seemingly done some kind of deal with Mexico. So we're going to talk about that. But um, let's perhaps, before we go any further, just have a look at that week ahead and we'll talk about uh, the key items here that we know are going to happen. So these are all the scheduled events, mostly by way of economic data. Um, so I'll have a quick look through here before then, just um, thinking about last week. We definitely had a, a big, big week last week. Uh, most of it centered around the idea that the Fed are going to accelerate their rate cutting cycle. Or well, they're going to begin it, and then it's going to accelerate faster than expected. More bad data from the, the U.S. on Friday uh, with the non-farm payrolls disappointing. Um, but if we look at the week ahead, I mean, we've already had some Japanese GDP data this morning that slightly beat expectations. So 0.5, uh, sorry, 0.6% growth rather than 05 expected. We've had some Chinese uh, trade balance figures, the import uh, data disappointed. Uh, dropping over 8% on a year-on-year -year basis. Um, but other than that, I mean, today is quite quiet. Um, from a, a data point of view, um, we have some bank holidays going on um, in Europe, but um, also normally the Monday after non-farm payrolls Friday is a pretty quiet affair when it comes to uh, economic data being announced. So today will probably, well, certainly from a scheduled news flow point of view, um, won't be too interesting, I wouldn't say. Um, tomorrow, just looking at some of the other fact. I mean, you've got a Japanese-US kind of trade talks going on through the week, by the way. Um, not expecting too much from that, other than potential risk for um, Trump to, to throw in some more spanners into the works, but we'll see. Um, but we've got some wage growth and, and, well, just generally the labor market report from the UK on Tuesday. Um, again, nothing massive from the US, I wouldn't say, in terms of uh, key data points. Uh, so we move into Wednesday, and this certainly becomes the biggest day of the week from an economic data point of view, in my opinion. And there's something underlined there, and it's going to happen at 1.30 p.m. on Wednesday, and it's called US CPI. This is the absolute big one of the whole week. Um, I'll review it in a second, but last week was a monster week for um, assets like equities, assets like gold, assets like bonds um, rising rapidly off the back of uh, the Fed turning a lot more dovish. Now, the only way the Fed are going to be able to start cutting rates is if inflation uh, starts to tick down, starts to tick lower. Um, Wednesday's reading, which will give us the inflation readings for the month of May, is absolutely critical. And this will be the first item on the agenda since the payrolls data last week. This will be the big item that really tells us, can the Fed start cutting in July or not? And as I'll go on to show you, um, analysts are now thinking there are going to be three rate cuts in 2019. We're almost halfway through the year. Um, as Ant was saying on Twitter over the weekend, I, I just I think it's too aggressive. I, I think that analysts have... Um, now overextended their expectations towards rate cuts, but we'll see because that inflation data on Wednesday is absolutely pivotal for that. Um, Thursday, uh, dominated by, well, will be dominated by UK politics, or certainly here in the UK, um, it'll all be about the first round of ballots uh, for Conservative leadership. So we'll talk about this during the briefing, um, Boris and Gove uh, having to fight off um, cocaine taking um, accusations, well not accusations, evidence in his youth um, which has kind of derailed his campaign somewhat so we'll talk about that. Um, and then Friday the key kind of news here again underlying, we've well, got some Chinese data of interest with industrial production but retail sales coming out of the US uh, will be another big one but for me um, all eyes on the US CPI data at 1.30 p.m. on Wednesday. And will that alter the current market's expectations with regards to how quickly the Fed are going to start cutting rates? Um, if you're just getting to your desks, five things you need to know to start the day. And the first one um, happened over the weekend. And, and if I just flick back to the charts, this is about Trump and Mexico. 
Uh, flip back to the chart and let's have a look at the Mexican peso actually because it's rallied quite strongly. You can see this gap higher here on the Mexican peso. Um, I'll just draw a rectangle there, big jump higher. So the market opened a lot higher um, this morning to get the week going. And if I draw a line there, we just kind of jumped back up above this low point that we had on the 29th of May. And so the peso, I guess the next target would be this one here, which is that top that we had on, on the 30th of May. So the peso nice and strong. And this is off news that a, uh, a deal a deal has been done um, between Trump and the, and the Mexicans. Um, some kind of, not much detail it must be said, but some kind of deal where they'll be um, involving agricultural commodities and then um, i.e. Mexico buying more agricultural commodities from the US and in exchange um, they're going to uh, stem the immigration situation. Although what I would say is um, the Mexicans have been uh, less forthcoming with their sort of um, confirmation that this deal has happened. Some of the sources over in Mexico are saying, oh, well, I'm not sure what the agricultural deal is all about. But anyway, Trump has his headline and markets have moved. And it does, you know, with, with this whole global trade war risk involving Donald Trump, obviously you go through your ebbs and flows and we're at the whim of the, the man and his Twitter feed. But um, it does seem that we've got continued positive direction with regards to some kind of resolution with the Mexican situation. You can't say that about the Chinese situation, which still um, remains um, unresolved for sure. So that definitely is still a risk on the table. But we have a slight positive this morning that's kind of feeding into market sentiment. And so the peso is the one leading the charge to the upside. Uh, if you have a look at other markets, um, let's just bring out the S&P chart here make that a bit bigger. You've seen a, a bit of a gap open, but uh, the market was unable to sustain that gap. I'll draw another rectangle in there, which shows you where the market closed on Friday, and then we jumped up and opened above Friday's high this morning, or I should say overnight, but then we've drifted back lower and been a bit of a flat line. I'm going to draw a line here. A bit of a flat line with Friday's high still being that um, key resistance that's really shaped um, most of the session so far. Um, so stocks tried to go higher, but haven't really been able to add to last week's gains, which were sensational. And I'll come back to that point in a second, but just wanted to review the, the early movers this morning because gold's come under pressure. Uh, so here gold gapped lower. So here's the box. Here's Friday's close and gold gaps lower, opens lower. And then we've definitely continued and extended on those moves to the downside and um, right now we're just trading down below um, the kind of break of this uh, double bottom we had on the afternoon of the 5th and the, the morning of the 6th of May last week okay so gold under pressure so this is just a little bit of positive sentiment as a result of the US Mexican trade deal of sorts and so the safe haven markets of gold and, and the yen as well um, have come under pressure. So the yen's down on the day, despite obviously that GDP data that beat expectations. Um, let's just have a quick look at that. So uh, one second, here's the, here's the yen against the dollar. And so we've gapped lower again, lots of gaps in the markets this morning. Um, let me just alter a couple of these lines. And for the yen, we've broken below Friday's low. And again, that's been quite a nice resistance uh, ever since. So a slight risk on tone. Um, with regards to T-notes, um, another safe haven market, obviously. Let me go to a 60-minute chart. Um, another gap uh, here as the market opens lower. But for T-notes, haven't really, not like gold opened lower and extended lower. T-notes has not. T-notes opened lower and it's kind of been a bit of a chop fest around the low point that we had um, on Friday. Um, so, uh, well, that's Thursday, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, Tino's yet to really extend lower, but certainly in the main, a general uh, slight positive vibe. Um, and it, it emphasis on the word slight um, and really led by the Mexican peso. Um, so, that's the situation with this morning's sentiment. Um, let me go back to my kind of headlines and you know we'll talk about Boris we'll talk about stocks so you know let's 
let's let's move on here and and think about um, other factors. And I want to talk about last week, and I want to talk about the Fed, and I want to talk about rate cut expectations. And we'll have a quick review of the the kind of key data that we had on Friday that was disappointing. So just first up, though, this is a look at the, some of the key global markets and how they performed last week. And a, a, just a quite sensational week for U.S. equities. Check out the top of the list, Dow Jones, S&P 500, um, both climbing in excess of 4% across last week. Uh, MSCI World Equity Index, also 4% to the good. Uh, the NASDAQ higher, gold ramping higher, over 3%. Um, stock 600 up. Uh, so you can you get the vibe here. Um, it's basically stocks and gold um, up through the roof. Um, topics, Japanese index, of course, Asia X, Japan, positive. So every, everything pretty positive, apart from the dollar and crude oil. And crude oil particularly um, getting some downside. We'll talk about crude in a minute because crude has turned and it's tried to climb higher this morning. It's it's finding it hard work, but we'll talk about crude oil at the end. But I just wanted to put this on the table here to just show you how dramatic the movement has been last week. And why has this happened? Well, of course, it's mostly due to the fact that the Fed last week, at the start of the week, indicated, so this was Jerome Powell's speech, uh, the Fed indicated um, that uh, the probability of a, a rate cut is climbing. The Fed have said that ultimately economic momentum in the US is dropping and that they're looking to perhaps you know, start to behave in a way to be much more supportive and stimulative with their policy tools. So um, let's look at the data on Friday that just added more fuel to that argument because we got much worse than expected non-farm payrolls data. So this is looking at how many jobs were created uh, in the month of May, and it came in at 75,000, way below what we were expecting, which was 185,000. They also chopped the April reading. They revised that down. It was 263,000. They revised it down to 224,000. They also revised down March. Okay, so from a job creation point of view, um, the labor market report from the U.S. on Friday was really bad. There's, there's no getting away from that. One caveat, it wasn't quite as bad as the reading we had for February, which was down at 56,000, but nevertheless, really bad. But as I was saying during, you know, in the prep for uh, the data on Friday, you've got to understand that really most economists, most investors, most traders aren't particularly focusing on job creation at this point in the economic cycle. And that's because the unemployment rate's at a 50-year low. Um, the labor market... Um, is becoming tighter and tighter and when you're getting towards you know late cycle then generally speaking you see a lot more volatility in job creation figures because you know, you know the employment rate is so strong so you shouldn't be particularly surprised by this and you shouldn't be particularly surprised by the fact we're going to get more volatility in this data set the non-farm payrolls data um, as we go through the rest of the year, okay, it's very much late cycle behavior. What's more interesting for me is the wage growth figures, because ultimately, are the Fed, yes, okay, you know, headline data like payrolls really bad, um, you know, so like the manufacturing ISM data bad, but are the Fed going to cut rates? Is the data bad enough? Is the key question. And ultimately, what will force the Fed's hand is. Well, the last bit of the jigsaw is that inflation needs to now weaken, okay? And the only way inflation is going to weaken if wage growth stops happening. So what was supportive of rate cuts on Friday was actually the fact that the wage growth data, we're looking at the average hourly earnings here, and for the month of May, wage growth went up by 0.2%. Now, we had expected a 0.3% growth rate, so was, this was worse than expected, but it only just. I mean, it's in line with the last three months, okay? It's not like we're down at 0.1 or 0. So you haven't seen a change of trend here. It just wasn't as high as expected, okay? Um, so... How has that panned out and how has that altered the expectation of the Fed cutting rates? So I'm looking at the CME um, CME Group website here. This is quite a good, something called the CME Fed Watch Tool. Um, you, most of you guys will know about this. This is looking at, well, 
at each meeting at the top here, the next meeting uh, is coming on the 19th of June. And it's saying, well, what's the probability of where interest rates will be after that meeting? And at the moment, there's a 79.2% chance that interest rates stay unchanged. So currently, uh, the Fed's interest rate is between 2.25% and 2.5%. And we're not expecting a change. Despite all this weak data, the general school of thought is that June, the June meeting's too early. So most likely, 79% chance rates stay unchanged. But when you move to the July meeting, so there's a meeting on the 31st of July, if we click on that button, we'll then look at how things shift. Remember, currently, rates are between 2.25 and 2.5. Apparently now, according to market expectations, there's only a 19% chance that rates will stay unchanged by the July meeting. So it's now 66.3% chance that the Fed will cut rates at their end of July meeting. Okay. You've got some wildly dovish predictions over here. 14.7% think there'll be a double rate cut of 50 basis points, 0.5%. Then we check September. Here's, this is important as well. The September probabilities now indicate two rate cuts. Two rate cuts from the Fed by September's meeting. So the market consensus is the Fed cut once in their July meeting and cut again in their next meeting in September. Then we click on October and here expectations are that no more rate cuts in October. We stick at 1.75% to 2% range. But then when you flick on December, we're just, oh, actually it has just changed. Okay, it literally has just changed in the last 30 minutes. Uh, 30 minutes ago, we did have 1.5% to 1.75% just marginally edging out um, 1.75 to 2. Basically, 30 minutes ago, it was an expectation that the Fed would cut three times this year. Now, that has just marginally tweaked back, but you can see it's pretty even. The reason why it's marginally tweaked back is because of this Mexico trade deal. Okay, um, But the point is, we're almost evens neck and neck for a three rate cuts this year versus a, a two rate cuts this year. Okay, This is one of the reasons why the S&P has not been able to rally above 2,900 off this Mexico news. It's because good news now on trade means less likelihood of the Fed cutting rates, certainly three times. I mean, I thought three times was way overdoing it anyway. Um, but the point is, right now, markets are expecting one cut in July, cut number two in September, and it's neck and neck for three cuts or stick at two for December. Okay, and these are the big influences that are moving um, markets. We've got a we've got a good um, chart here to show you how quickly expectations have changed. This is how the probability will there be three rate cuts in 2019, and the probability of this has ramped higher, too high too fast. You know, this is quite behavioral, I would say. Um, it's been below 10% all year. That's the chances of three rate cuts have been below 10% all year. We broke 10%. And now we've gone up to 63%. So I believe this is a knee jerk, emotional behavioral reaction. I think at best, you're looking at two cuts. Um, and so I would expect this probability to now soften and drop back lower unless the inflation data on Wednesday is lower than expected. So let's have a look at this inflation data on Wednesday. This is the current chart looking at inflation, headline inflation over the last 12 months. Okay. Now, most of this behavior that you can see on this chart is perhaps related to, to crude oil. Certainly the left-hand side where you saw inflation very high, summer of 2018. Um, oil prices climbing and then we had the big oil sell-off and so oil led to inflation dropping to one and a half percent now we've rebounded marginally here now we've rebounded to the key two percent handle which is the fed's target it's all very well and good the fed cutting rates as inflation's trending lower but what happens if inflation's trending back higher then the fed have got a big problem but if we smooth this out and remove energy costs and indeed remove food costs and look at core inflation, which is the tool the Fed would look at the most, well then it's been quite flat to, well, we had a 2% print for March, which was the lowest reading in more than 12 months. 
So this is where we started to, to get a little bit more confident that maybe the Fed are not only have they ended their rate hiking cycle, they may well be on the verge of starting a new cutting cycle. So 2% for March, but then we bounced back to 2.1% in April. So we'll see. All eyes for me, when, 1.30 on Wednesday, what is the core inflation print for May? Um, is it 2.1%? Is it 2%? Does it, drop, does it drop below 2%? If it does, well, right. That three rate cut idea in 2019, the expectations of that will start ramping higher. Um, however, if core inflation holds at 2.1 or let's just say it goes up to 2.2, well, then you're going to see quite a dramatic correction in those expectations. So how is that going to play out in the markets? And let's go flick back to the charts here because I showed you that stat. All the moves last week were based off this idea that the Fed have turned way more dovish and then the data was supportive of that with the payrolls figures being so weak. And so equities through the roof, all, all these charts you're looking at pretty much are showing moves to the upside, okay? Um, so if you get a high inflation print on Wednesday, well, this will be the big moment. That'll be the best scenario for traders because, I mean, let me go to a daily chart here for the S&P. You know, quite a phenomenal uh, week, five green candles in a row, four of them pretty big ones. and. Here we are kind of just sat oh, testing that high point that we had um, back on the 16th of May. And there's definitely room to move back lower off a high inflation print. So we price back out rate cuts. Okay. However, low, infra low inflation on Wednesday. And I tell you what, we are not far off the high of the year. We're not far off the all-time high for the S&P. And low inflation print below 2%. On Wednesday that could be the final little catalyst to get stocks ramping back up towards their highs for the year off the back of a more aggressive dovish Fed in terms of rate cuts okay so very critical this data on Wednesday um, let's have a look at gold which is also very sensitive obviously to that, that kind of rate cutting scenario gold's been lower this morning off the Mexico news but it's very high still when you look back over the last week, last week was just extraordinary for gold. Let me just move a few lines here. Um, move my lines like that. So um, we had a big test of the high of the year on Friday. Just broke it briefly, but then we pulled back. And this morning we're a little bit lower. Keep your eye on that high point that we have back in March as perhaps support on the way back down here. But for gold, can it break and extend above the February high? Well, only if inflation data on Wednesday is low. If inflation data on Wednesday is high, well then gold's gonna move back in here. Um, we've got some resistance down here from the mid-May high, uh, the 1300 handle around that area, okay? So certainly gold very sensitive to this data coming Wednesday. Uh, finally here, as we're talking about Wednesday, you can't not talk about government bonds in the US which have ramped higher off the expectation of more rate cuts coming um, let me just adjust a few lines here um, let me just get rid of that one so we did make a new high for the year briefly Friday just breaking above the triple top that we had Monday Tuesday Wednesday last week uh, but then we pulled back and this morning we're marginally lower off the Mexico news but you can see there's not much appetite to to sell bonds at this point despite the slight positive sentiment in markets or reluctance for t-notes to move lower but if inflation is higher than expected on wednesday then there's a lot of room to move back to the downside the key support of the medium term would be this high point from back in march um, huge amount of room to move back lower here off high inflation as we reduce our rate cut expectations but of course t-notes can punch higher and continue this upward trend if inflation is low and our rate cut expectations continue to move north. Okay, so Wednesday, that's what it's all about this week, for sure. Um, okay, just to finish off the briefing then, um, we can't not talk about um, the Conservative Party leadership race. If you're in the UK, this is all that the news is interested in. I mean, you go onto the Bloomberg homepage, and it's just all about, it's, it's about Rudd, it's about 
Boris, it's about Gove. Um, certainly in the UK, we're being dominated by this, and that will continue to be the case, obviously. Here's a little stat, I'm not sure if you can see that that well. Just um, looking at the updated numbers in terms of probabilities. Um, still the case that Boris is, is out in front. be interesting to see what happens to Michael Gove's um, popularity uh, as we go through the course of this week. Uh, big cocaine scandal blew up in his face over the weekend. This is going back 20 years, mind, but 20 years ago in his early 30s or whatever. As a journalist, apparently he took cocaine several times at social events. Um, and he's defiant in the face of this uh, media storm that's, that's hit him. What I would say is, think about Donald Trump. Has Donald Trump changed the way political races pan out? Because don't forget the uh, presidential campaign that Donald Trump went through, that he ultimately ended up being successful in. And the amount of scandals that hit Donald Trump was quite extraordinary, and yet... He ploughed on in the face of adversity and then went on to win it. So I think Gove is trying to just play the Trump card, and that is to just bat it off, bat it off, continue talking about his his policies. Um, he's got a, quite an interesting policy around revamping VAT, making it a lot more simple, making that tax rate a lot lower, making it more into a bit of a sales tax that kind of other countries employ. Um, that would be very positive for for business. Um, there's, you know, the the quarterly VAT return that businesses have to do is a real pain, and that that that's quite a popular um, idea, I believe. But whether it's enough to um, over you know to overshadow the cocaine scandal, I don't know. We'll have to see. But look, Boris still out in front as it stands. Um, something that's happened over the weekend hasn't got too much attention in some of the press this morning but definitely interesting for the leadership race uh, definitely interesting for brexit so over the weekend the uk did a deal with south korea agreeing a trade deal post brexit and the trade deal says that the eu uh, sorry the uk will continue to have a, a bilateral trade agreement with south korea that's in line with the trade agreement that they currently have in existence with the eu so it's like South Korea is saying, great, Britain will keep things the same with you as they are with the EU and we'll, we'll give you a deal. Um, certainly it's in South Korea's interests. Um, South Korea um, export, uh, what is it, I think six and a half billion dollars worth of goods a year to the UK. Uh, the UK is South Korea's second biggest European market after Germany. That's just because the UK is the second biggest economy. But it's an important exporting destination for South Korea. So it's definitely within their interest. The important thing about this is South Korea is quite a big, um, important uh, export market for UK businesses. Um, and with this deal having been agreed, that's now 12 trade agreements made for post-Brexit. And 12 doesn't sound many when you're thinking that the number of, I think we need... I think there's something like 61, 62 uh, countries we need to uh, finalise trade agreements with for when we leave the EU. And we've only managed 12. But the point is the 12 we've managed are some of the big ones. And so actually 63% um, of trade currently covered by EU agreements, 63% have now been agreed bilaterally with the UK. So the reason why I'm pointing this out is because... The risk of hard Brexit, the, the risk of the damage that, a, a bo, let's say, a Boris-led hard Brexit, the risk of that does reduce as more and more of these trade agreements get made. So this might play into Boris's hands um, a little bit, and maybe the fears around Boris coming in, um, being more aggressive, pushing for a 31st of October um, no-deal exit, well... Um, and, and don't forget, that's another, well, what are we, four months away? So we may, may well get a few more of these trade agreements in place. I'm just saying this, this probably plays into Boris's hands, this kind of development. And Liam Fox um, has done the business here over the weekend. You could say with Liam Fox, I mean, I, well, better late than never would be perhaps the best way of describing this because he had a deadline to um, agree 62 trade agreements by the 31st of March. Um, and he spectacularly failed in that. But at least he's getting on with it now. And, and South Korea was one of the final big, 
big ones to get in the bag. So this is quite an important one. Um, okay, so plenty of Brexit news as we go through the week. Uh, Brexit, I should say, um, UK lead or Conservative Party leadership race. And look towards Thursday, first round of ballots for the Conservative leader. We'll talk way more about this as we go through the week. But certainly in the UK, the leadership race is going to ramp up and up and up as we go into that first ballot on Thursday. OK, I'm going to fin finally finish off with a look at today's calendar just to get back into the mindset of what's going on right now. And as I said at the outset, we've had the Japanese and Chinese data already. We've got some UK figures coming at 9.30, um, GDP estimates for April. Um, we've got services <coughs> estimates as well, um, industrial output and manufacturing output. Um, I wouldn't call, well, maybe the GDP figure. The UK now do release GDP estimates monthly. Most other countries do not. So we're, this is quite a new way of doing things. So as it stands, we're not quite that confident whether this is accurate yet but we'll see at least it's a little sneak at quarter two remember april here so a little sneak into quarter two uh, might be interesting um, other than that we've got some housing data out of the u.s oh sorry no that's canada uh, we've got jolts job opening data out of the u.s so really this afternoon forget about it from a, a data point of view a couple of bank of england speakers um, on the mic but otherwise we're expecting a relatively quiet session from a news flow point of view we've got a slight mild tone uh, to the session with regards to um, sentiment as a result of the US-Mexico um, trade agreement. Uh, let's see how, like, how long that can continue. Okay, thanks a lot guys. That's it from the desk. Enjoy your sessions.